pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors, experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. All right, Savvy investors out there, it is a super duper treat. I am interviewing a super stud advanced deal maker, not from Oklahoma. That's right. This is my first interview over phone on the podcast savvy radio show i'm interviewing lee smith from indianapolis indiana say hello hey guys how's it going out there in okay country yeah oklahoma that's right baby well the investors run great (laughs) you know i was talking to an investor yesterday and they're like, you know, Oklahoma doesn't have all the best deals. And, I, you know, I've lived here, been investing for 16 years. And the crazy thing is, when I started talking to you, you have better deals. I mean, your numbers, you're like, yeah, I can buy this for 35000 and I can rent it out for $800 a month. I almost peed my pants. Right. Is that, right. So let's just go over who you are. Okay, so your name is Lee Smith. How long have you been doing this? Okay. Well, like you said already, my name is Lee Smith. I'm out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I've been investing in real estate for 24 years now. I've uh, been flipping since I was 21. My goals were always uh, buy them, live in them for two years to beat capital gains, and then sell them. You know, while we were fixing them up, we were, you know, living in them for two years. And then about 2007, I got pretty hardcore, which was right when the market really did its dump. I was doing a lot more flips uh, just outside of, you know, living in them. And I actually did a couple flips. I I did flips throughout the whole market downturn and had a couple investors who I've always grown up in a family where um, rent and hold, you know, rentals were taboo. You know, uh, tenants and toilets were just totally bad. And uh, 2007 came and a couple of my investors that I was working with, they couldn't do flips. And so they wanted to rent them out. And so they kind of, one of my guys told me, hey, I got to move to Atlanta and uh, I want you to rent out my properties. And I said, hey, I have no clue how to rent properties. And he said, uh, just do it. I trust you. You can make some mistakes or whatever. And so uh, it's been uh, going that way. Um, so we've been doing it for, what, almost eight years now. We've been doing rentals. Currently, uh, I own about 15 to 18 myself. And I have several investors, both in-state, out-of-state, and out-of-country. I have investors in Singapore, Australia, Finland, different places around the world, Israel. Then we work with these investors. We help them buy properties. I'm I'm a licensed realtor, uh, but don't hold it against me. I know (laughs) most people are are very, uh, most investors are very anti-realtors, but I don't like most realtors. And I I mean, I think that kind of goes with the whole thing, but I do like the information that I am given because I am a realtor, um, the capabilities that I have to do searches and uh, comparative market analysis and, and so on and so forth. In our market here in Indy, Zillow and Trulia, their numbers are crazy off. And it's because our local MLS is pro- heavily protective of their data. I've been a realtor since 2007. I went the retail route where I was trying to work with buyers and sellers and that sort of stuff. And and I'm just, I'm more geared towards investors. So basically, uh, I have my own brokerage now and I, I, I only work with investors and I'm actually very picky about who I do work with. I generally tend to stay away from newbies because of the fact that you got to learn the whole process and stuff like that. And a lot of times people, they go out and hear the gurus, which is fine, but then, you know, they, they hold to their cause and they constantly question and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, it takes a special person to work with and, and I'm sure I'm not the easiest guy to get along with. But, no. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you're great. You know, let's just let's just preface people where how we met. You and I met at the Ohio RIA convention that Dina Cox was hosting, and we were in a class that was kind of a private class of about forty investors right. that have done fifty or more deals, and we sat by each other and became fast friends. I, That's right. I got a quick quick question for you. You know, I get a question a lot from some students and stuff. They're like, "Should I get my real estate license? What motivated you back in '07?" to become a realtor, to get your real estate license. Why did you do that? Well, I did it because of the fact that, um, you know, at that point in time, I would, I would call realtors up and I was doing a lot of legwork. I mean, I was, I would go out and, and I would narrow down, I would find a hundred houses that I liked. Uh, I would narrow them down to six or seven. And then I would narrow those down. You know, we do drive bys or whatever. And then I would narrow it down to two or three. And the realtor I was using at the time, I called his assistant and I said, hey, I want to get CMAs, which is a comparative market analysis. 
Uh, I want to get some CMAs on these three properties. About a half an hour later, the realtor calls me up, and he's like, what are you doing? You're killing my people. This is ridiculous. Three CMAs? I'm like, really, dude? I went and looked at 100 houses, narrowed it down to three, and all I want you to do is to run a couple of reports. So, you know, I mean, and you're going to get paid. <laughs> and I'm that's paying right. You. And I'm like, I'm doing all the work for you, brother. You're getting paid. And uh, you try and find a realtor, and they would take you out, and you get the, the bangly jewelry uh, realtor, and she would take you out to look at a house. And, and, you know, the nature of this business is I want houses that need a lot of work, right? You know, I mean, we love the paint and carpet replacement and, you know, make $20,000. But let's face it, that doesn't happen as much as it used to. But, you know, if I take a, a, a traditional realtor into a house that needs a lot of work, they're like, oh, my gosh, don't touch anything. It's nasty. And, uh, you know, so they just don't have a clue what I'm looking for. And uh, so I became a realtor because mainly it was that. I wanted the capabilities to, to find my own deals, to work with people I wanted to work with, and, you know, be able to do my own thing. You know, I haven't looked back since. Uh, I'm still a realtor. And I know a lot of investors don't like realtors. And I understand why. I can... I can count on one hand how many realtors I know and trust, and I've lost four of those fingers in a uh, chainsaw accident. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't – a lot of times I'll hear the uh, the thing, oh, now you got to disclose everything. And I'm like, I, I really don't have a problem with that because, you know, I mean, that's – the whole business is it's a long-term deal. Yeah. And it doesn't affect me. I, I, I tell people – Hey, I'm a licensed realtor, and you know, and my my big joke is always, "Hey, I'm a licensed realtor. Hey, don't hold it against me." And uh, I think it actually gets me some credibility because of the fact that you know, I mean, I know how the state, you know, how the laws all work, and so on and so forth. But I really don't have. I've never ever had anybody question me like uh, or give me grief because I was a realtor. I actually just think that it it works to my advantage, especially when sitting down and talking to sellers and buyers and stuff like that. So, sure, you know, and I just okay. all I have to do is pull one little disclosure on the uh, the uh, purchase agreement or whatever, and just basically says, "Hey, I'm licensed in the state of Indiana," and it all goes away. So, all right, so let's rewind. Can you remember back 20 years ago, what got you into real estate? How did it happen? I know you want to be a millionaire, but, but like, what, 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 I'm not already. I know. I was, I was going to pull it out of you. You know, 15 uh, units, you should be, anyway, in the property management. It's great success. I, I love successful people, and you are successful. What got you turned on? You know, for me, of course, it was the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. But for you, what was it? What? What got your wheels churning so long ago? It really wasn't any gurus or anything. I mean, I actually never even got involved with a guru until 2007. But mainly it was I grew up in a family. We owned a, a traditional brick-and-mortar, true-value hardware store back in, uh, well, from 75 up until the till the middle 90s. And so I grew up in a hardware store, and I grew up with uh, parents who had gotten the money to open the hardware store by flipping houses. So it kind of came natural. I mean, it was funny throughout my teenage years. I could tell everybody who came into the store how to, uh, you know, replace all the plumbing underneath the kitchen sink or whatever, but I had never actually done it myself. And then uh, when I turned 21, I wasn't doing very good in college, and uh, my parents called me. We had some family-owned businesses, and they said, uh, hey, you know, another franchise opened up if, up in uh, Kokomo, Indiana. If you want to go take over that business, go ahead. And I got up there and I rented a place for about six months. And then I thought to myself, man, I'm just going to buy a house and rehab it, sell it and see what happens. And I, I didn't make near as much money as I make now on a, a flip. I mean, even 2007 on, I, I made money on all my flips. It's all a live and learn process, man. You just got to be as savvy as you can be and not get stuck in analysis paralysis. Right. So now what's your main thrust now? Are you you're representing sellers, obviously, as a property manager? Are you still flipping? Are you holding? What's your what's your agenda? What's your goals now? I'm not doing as many flips as I used to. I am actually doing a buy and hold strategy. What we've run into is uh, I'm buying a lot of properties uh, and then I'm getting them rehabbed and then I'm renting them out. And then um, a lot of my investors are just calling me up and uh, about every two to three months I'll get, you know, each one of my investors calls me and says, hey, what do you got? What is personally in your inventory? And so I'm like, uh, okay. And so I show them what I've got. And uh, then they say, okay, well, how much do you want for number one, number four, number six? And I'll give them a price, and nine times out of ten, they're just like, okay, I'll buy them. So we've been doing that a lot, and I've still been getting just crazy deals on houses 
that I just can't turn away. I mean, we, we've got, uh, I got a full crew of guys that work for me and do stuff for me. Actually, I got two crews and, uh, I've got three houses waiting to be rehabbed at this point in time. They're in our inventory and, and we just don't have the time to get to them yet. But I've even sold some of those deals off to my investors. And so, you know, that's where we're kind of at. We're at buy and hold. I've kind of got a goal set for myself that I want to do some, uh, creative financing deals over the next year. Uh, one to two um, seller finance deals a month, plus, you know, the rest of the business that we're doing. And so um, we're just working through it, man, chugging along. That's awesome. So with all this, you got deals in the pipeline or already closed out. How are you finding these deals right now? What's your marketing? I know you're savvy with technology, but what's your, where are they coming from? Um, we still do a lot of snail mail campaigns. We do some, um, I don't want to give away my business here, but uh, we do some <laughs> eviction stuff. You know, we do some eviction stuff, you know, landlords that are evicting people. We just kind of send them a note. Hey, man, is it time to get out of the business? Give us a call. We do a lot of direct mail. We do um, a lot of advertisements on like, you know, when we've got rental properties, you know, all of our signage that's out in the yard is advertised and then we buy houses and stuff like that. So I work with a lot of uh, you know, I, I do some wholesale deals myself, and I work with a lot of the wholesalers here in Indianapolis, and they call me up and, hey, I got these deals. You want them? And, uh, in fact, I've got two of the big, bigger uh, wholesalers here in Indy. They call me and say, hey, I got a call on this house. You want to go with me to go look at it? And so I'll go into the house, and they'll just say to me, you know, w what's your number? What, w what do you want to pay for it? And I'll say, you know, hey, I'll, I'll pay you, uh, you know, ten grand." Or, you know, I'll pay you 20 grand or 30 grand or whatever it is, you know, and I give them that number and then they go work their magic and they come back to me and, and they're like, okay, I can get it for you, you know, 12 grand or whatever, and whatever I originally said. And then, you know, they may make 2,000, 5,000, you know, I, I, one of my uh, wholesalers, she made uh, $27,000 in wholesaling fees in October. And that was just one deal. If the numbers work, man, I'm, I'm cool with it. I don't care. She can make twenty-seven grand on that deal. The numbers work great. I mean, we, you know, we made up more than enough money to meet our strategies. Sure. All right. So you kind of do grassroots marketing on the ground, word of mouth, uh, right. reputation. You didn't mention MLS at all, and you're a realtor. Tell me what's your strategy there. Are you even looking in the MLS every once in a while? Do you have searches set up? Tell me about your process or your strategies for the MLS. Well, I mean, basically, we use the MLS. I use the MLS basically for a comp, for comps. Most of my investors, they want the, uh, we don't work in war zones, but we'll work in border zones. You know, they're, they're aware of the risks and stuff like that, and, and they like the profit that comes with those. So a lot of my investors like those border zones and, and then, you know, coming into the, the, the bread and butter neighborhoods and stuff like that. And occasionally I'll get a call from an investor who wants more bread and butter, that they're more interested in the houses. You know, here in Indy, you can get like a house that was built in um, uh, within the past 10 years, uh, like a three bedroom or four bedroom, you know, two and a half or so bath. One of the big developers went through something like that. But you can get those anywhere from 80000 to $120,000 here. And so occasionally I'll get an investor who wants to do that. And I've got some virtual assistants that go through and they'll be searching the MLS looking for, you know, stuff that the second it comes on the market, we go and do some comparables and we find out if it's a possibility for us. And then we forward it on to our investor clients and say, hey, is this something you're interested in? And then see what they want to do. Well, what keeps you so motivated? You've been doing this for 20 years. And just talking to you on the phone is like when talking to you at the conference just a couple of weeks ago. What keeps you jazzed? I mean, you are on fire. I, and I think you and I have talked about this a couple of times. I love solving problems and I love all the creativity in this industry. I mean, there is just, I mean, anything you can think of, there's just ways to make money in this. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and not that money is my driving factor. I mean, people, you know, they say, what's your big why? And my big why is that, you know, if I want to go out and I just bought a brand new truck, I'm picking it up today. If I want to go out and pay cash for a brand new truck, I want to have that cash sitting there ready to rock and roll. Now, you know, not to say that I'm going to pay in cash for this truck because leverage is key, but, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I want to have that capability. You know, I like to, to race SCCA car racing, and if I want to go out and buy a car for 5000 or $10,000, I want to have that cash sitting there that I could just go and do that stuff. So that stuff motivates me. But, I mean, you know, it's not it's not my what I want to say. I, I just like the creativity and just – you know, it lights me up when I can buy a deal and just do some creative, just insane strategies and making money all the way around through the whole deal. 
And, uh, you know, it, it just, that's what really keeps me going. All right, let's switch gears. Uh, you're managing property. Tell me about a, a tenant story that just popped in your head right now. A good. Oh bad, my gosh. Ugly. So we have a, we have a, a double or a duplex and it's an over under. So there's a two bedroom upstairs and there's a three bedroom downstairs. It's kind of a long story, but I'll try and make it as quick as possible. So I've got a 20 something guy living upstairs and I've got a 20 something girl living downstairs and she's got a, a new baby. And, uh, anyway, so she calls me and she says, uh, I think the guy upstairs is peeping on me. And I said, are you kidding me? And she said, no, the ceiling tiles in my kitchen are, are, are moved. And I'm like thinking to myself, obviously I'm, I'm scared to death that something's going on, whatever, you know what I mean? And, you know, and you have to take people seriously and all this sort of stuff. But I'm thinking to myself, what kind of idiot peeper is going to leave the ceiling tiles moved? And uh, so I'm thinking to myself, something's just not right. And so anyway, so uh, she sends me a picture, and sure enough, this one ceiling tile is about halfway off, you know, I mean, like halfway open. And I'm like, man, you got to be a big-time idiot to go peeping on somebody and leave the physical evidence like that. But, you know, I've seen that stuff happen before. So anyway, so I called that guy and said, uh, you know, there's a, an attic area up there, and you know you're not supposed to be up in that area, right? He says, well, yeah, why would I go in there? And I said, well, I don't know. And I said, you know, it, it's pretty well sealed off, so I'm not sure how you're getting in there if you were, but... I said, you know, I know you had a guy staying with you, so I, I just want to make sure that, you know, he didn't, you know, come in and go into that back area. You know, I didn't want to come out and accuse this guy of anything because, you know, that's just a big mess. So I just kind of right. wanted to social engineer it. And so he was like, no, man. He goes, uh, my buddy left a few days ago, and, and uh, you know, we, we have no reason to go back there. We would never go back there. And I said, okay, that's fine. So anyways, a couple of days later, she calls me. and Well, not actually, well, I sent one of my guys out there, and I said, look, man, just go out and do a service call. And I said, go check and make sure that that thing is still sealed up. I mean, you know, we had used one-way screws, and we had done a bunch of other stuff. So there was really no way he could be accessing this area unless he had, you know, purposely broke through or something like this. But anyways... So a couple of days later, she calls me back. He had it again, and I say, "Oh my <laughs> but no god!" But no, but no one's there, or is he he says he hasn't been back, or is he still living there? Well, he's living there. He's upstairs, and she's downstairs. And so she calls me okay. two or three days later, and she tells me, "Hey, that ceiling tile has moved again." And I said, you got to be kidding me. And I said, so I call up one of my guys and I go, I don't know what's going on. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go up in the attic. We're going to lay insulation down over top of those ceiling tiles. And we're going to vapor barrier it, you know, and make it totally massively <laughs> secure, you know. And, and if anybody in their right mind is going in there and, you know, trying to dig to get to the tiles, you know, the ceiling tiles again, we're going to know it. I mean, we're going to have total proof of all this stuff. You know, we're talking deer cams and stuff like this. We were just massively brainstorming how we were going to catch this guy, right? And so anyway, so I said, all right, so go over later today. And so she, my guy says, okay, I'll head over there later today. About an hour later, the tenant, the girl downstairs, she calls me and she says, I figured it out. She says, if you open up the front door and you slam it, she says, the wind racing through the house moves all the ceiling tiles in the kitchen. Oh, no. All that time and effort. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All that time and all that effort. But I, I, we were lucky because we're big texters here. So she had actually texted me all that. She's like, oh, I figured it out. When you shut the door too fast, she said, the ceiling tiles in the kitchen move. And I was like, well, thank you for my proof in a text message. And, uh, yeah, and, you, and, yeah, course, see, as a, and as a realtor and manager, you did your job. I mean, and that's the one thing oh, yeah. that scares me in property management. They said, she said, and, you know, I'm getting raped in here because we didn't send someone over there, a maintenance call, just to verify Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to take that stuff seriously. I mean, you know, even if, you know, it's a little boy who cried wolf. I don't care if it's the third or fourth time he cries wolf. you got to take that stuff seriously. So, uh, you know, we always do, and uh, we do everything in our power. And, of course, we document everything heavily. And that's one of the big reasons why I'm real heavy into text messaging is because of the fact that, you know, I do backups of all my text messaging, and, and I can go back. And I do a lot of times. I'll go back and pull up text messages from, you know, six months or a year ago. Or if, if we ever go to court on a, uh, you know, with a, a tenant on eviction or something, like that, you know, we've got lots of documentable proof as to what exa exactly happened. We just don't get those issues. I mean, you know, knock on wood as I knock on my forehead, you know, we, we, we're we real good at CYA. Yeah, no, no doubt. I, everything has to run through text message. We, we don't even accept calls. We prefer text messaging. 
And we, and even if they say something on the phone, I'm like, you need to text that in for us to leave to go check out your property. All right, let's move on to another quick subject. All right. Virtual assistants, you drop VA all casual, like this is a regular occurrence. Tell me about your VAs. What are they doing for you? Uh, how long you've been doing it and success and failure of it? That's three big questions on VA. Uh, I've been using VA since probably 2007 or 2008. You know, people can get mad at me for this, but I hire people out of country. I have hired, I would say, probably close to 10 to 12 different VAs. It just depends. I'm I'm huge on you got to document your processes out beforehand, and then when you post your ads, you know, you've got it all documented out. Here's what I'm going to want you to do. Or, you know, I'll create a video using some software on my computer that basically shows exactly what I want them to do, and then I'll link to the video when I run the ad, and I'll get, um, you know, responses and bidding wars and stuff like that for how much they want to charge. And then, you know, I have them do whatever we told them to do. But I've had them do everything from creating websites for me. I have Well, I'll tell you what, I've got three right now. And I've got one that does, he's my VA for all my bookkeeping and accounting. He logs into my QuickBooks. He logs into my Lowe's. He logs into my, um, we have Menards out here. You guys don't probably have them, but they're a box store like a Lowe's or a Home Depot. So he'll log into those accounts, pull out all the invoices, and, and they've all been, we uh, PO them with whatever property they're for. And he'll go and he'll bill all my clients for that sort of stuff or bill me for it. Cool. You know, I log in and I pay all that stuff. I have two other VAs, and basically they answer our phones for us here. So, you know, any prospective tenants call in to get information about a property, they call and they get my virtual assistance, and they're actually out of the Philippines. So I have them working Eastern Standard Time. They're working basically from 10 a.m. until 9 p.m. every day. I have the one, what they do, they do a rotation. So they do four days one week, three days another week, and they're answering the phones that whole entire time. And then they do a lot of other clerical and assistant stuff for us keep a track of repairs that we need to make and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, it works out really well for us. I mean, that way I've got That's an awesome. actual human answer on the phone. Indiana is a uh, call recording, a one-way call recording state, so we record all of our calls. Right now this is being recorded. So we record all of our calls for extra proof. Uh, and then, um, you know, we, we keep track of everybody. We have a uh, contact manager software that we use, and they keep track of that, and they do a lot of follow-up. I, I'm huge on follow-up now. You know, we'll get them a code to go see, take a look at the house, and then we're going to follow up with them, you know, the next morning and say, hey, how did you like the house? If they don't already follow up with us. Or, you know, and two or three days later, we're hitting them up. And then I also have my guys send it out about twice a month. We send out a little note and say, hey, if you know anybody looking for a property, uh, you know, here's our website. We we put videos and pictures and all the information on all of our ads. So we're we're pretty much rocking and rolling on that stuff. That's awesome. What's your cost for that to run just to run your phones? Like, what do you, the, the Philippines people, is it like a monthly, weekly thing? And what's that cost? I'm actually still using Google Voice. So it's free. So the software um, is free. But, like, yes. when you forward it to the Philippines, are you forwarding it to the Philippines, I guess? Yeah, and they're working from their browser. So they're basically, um, you know, they've got Answering their, it, their yeah. Chrome cool. browser up or whatever up. And in that, with Google Voice, you can do text messaging. It's called Hangouts. So they can do all the text messaging through their, you know, their browser. Uh, I like Chrome. Or they can, you know, they can answer phones and all that sort of stuff because they ring into into the, the Hangouts app, which is all free from Google Voice. So we're using that. Now we have been considering switching to, a, you know, a full-time service or whatnot. But at this point, we haven't really needed to. How many units do you are managing right now? We've been kind of going through and, and um, letting some of our uh, investors go that are a little bit more trouble than they need to be. Um, so we're down to about 70 units right now we're managing. That's awesome. And then that phone service is, you know, I've heard the Philippines, it's like $3 an hour, $6 an hour. Do you pay them by the hour or is it just a flat fee? And what's that fee? I pay these guys about, each one of them is about 500 bucks a month is what I pay, okay, and they cool. provide their own internet connection, and they, you know, they, they answer the phones and stuff like that. Like I say, they're using their own computers. We make sure that they've got, you know, one of our questions when we interview a VA is what happens if you've got a deadline and your computer goes south? And so, you know, every single one of them is either, uh, you know, I've got a, an extra laptop or I've got another PC or uh, I can go around this corner to the internet cafe and I'm good. So, cool. um, Yeah. All right, dude, that's awesome. I got one more final question for you uh, about funding. How are you funding your deals now, and what's your main 
way that you'd like to fund them? Mainly right now we're doing kind of cash basis and we're doing some creative financing and stuff like that. I get some um, loans from private lenders and stuff like that, you know, and we've done some of the bank stuff or whatever. There's different markets where it's easier to get bank loans and you can do more blanket stuff, but we're not doing that here in Indy. I'm concentrating this year on doing a lot more seller financing. For 2016, we're going to try and get a lot more deals that are seller financed. It'll help the uh, the sellers out, help us out, doing some more private, you know, or personal, uh, or private or personal lending to get some more loans to do the rehabs. And we're selling a lot of properties on contract, uh, land contract, lease options, stuff like that. So we're getting a lot more money in from the down payments and the lead box. Awesome. All right. So it's been a super duper pleasure being with you, Lee Smith. I know that you will be back on the radio show. Uh, I'm just enthralled with uh, your passion especially for just outsourcing, even back in 07. I can't even remember what I was doing back in 07. I just now started turning up the, the virtual assistant. To, and my goal is yours, the same this year is to be a lot more creative in 2016 and doing some subject twos and owner finances. So I'm yeah, excited about yeah. that for you, and we'll, we'll have you back on the show for that. But anyway, okay. uh, is there any way that – are you open to anyone texting you, calling you, or they they may uh, connect with you through this podcast? Would you mind giving out your uh, contact information or whatever's best and convenient for you? My name is Lee Smith. My website is spousesbuyinghouses.com. Uh, you can email me at lee at spousesbuyinghouses.com. Uh, you can call our direct number or text us, uh, 317 317- Five three seven seven two four nine, and um, you know they'll forward it on to me and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, uh, my email is Lee at spousesbuyinghouses dot com, and uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or um, you know, happy to work with them. Also, so that's spouses buying houses. Remember that. What a great name and uh, a lot of kicks and giggles for especially ladies. All right, yeah. Lee, have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets. 